We'd like to welcome everyone to another edition of our Orthodox Bible Study Program coming from St. Nicholas uh, in Warren, Ohio. We welcome not only those who are with us, but also those who would be watching by way of uh, the Internet. Uh, let's begin by asking the Lord for the guidance of the Holy Spirit for our understanding of God's Word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, O Master who loves mankind, illumine our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your eternal Father, your all-holy, gracious, alike creating Spirit, now and ever, unto ages of ages. Amen. Again, welcome. Uh, we are uh, studying the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is in the Old Testament. It is the second book in the, uh, in the scripture. Those of you who are following by way of the Orthodox Study Bible that includes both Old and New Testament, we're on page 70. Those of you who are following by another text, another Bible, again, we are in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, and we are going to uh, continue where we left off, chapter 5, verse 1. Read along with me. Now after this, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go so that they may hold a feast to me in the desert. Um, the importance of uh, the words here, um, thus says the Lord, is a common phrase that is used in the Old Testament by the prophets of Israel. Remember we said that, that Moses is a prophet. He's the spokesman of God. He's the mouthpiece of God. And by extension, his brother Aaron so therefore, by saying, thus says the Lord God, it is to be understood that this is God's precise word. This is what God wants to be done. Okay? There's no hesitancy. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. In other words, a direct order actually is being given through Moses the prophet. Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the desert, uh, to hold a feast is a way of worshiping God and being in his presence, uh, celebrating uh, his presence among his people, and, uh, uh, and by doing so, uh, being able to, to increase their faith uh, and to be able to uh, dedicate themselves or rededicate themselves to the worship of their God. Uh, there are some who may have uh, weakened their faith. There are some who uh, may have been tempted by the beliefs of the other, the pagan religion of the Egyptians or even the Egyptian gods. But again, he's calling his people, okay? And by calling his people, we have to understand uh, the, this concept of church. Uh, ecclesia in, in Greek literally means uh, to call uh, the people of God together for a specific purpose to be in his presence, to, to worship him, and to be able to celebrate with him. So therefore, uh, this is exactly what is happening in this particular verse. Let's look at the response of Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said, Who is he that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Uh, this is a perfect sign of the, not only the obstinance of Pharaoh, but the extreme arrogance of Pharaoh. When he uh, uses this terminology that I do not know the Lord, it means that uh, he does not have any kind of uh, knowledge of him, who he is, uh, uh, what he has done. There's absolutely no appreciation. And also the implication being given here is that somehow God owes him some type of explanation, some kind of a, a reasoning uh, in order to obey uh, his voice. 
So uh, he uh, asked uh, a very important question. Um, you know, uh, I do not know the Lord. Who is this Lord? Who is this God? And so they said, the God of, our, of the Hebrews has called us to him. Let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest at any time death or slaughter should happen to us. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Why, Moses and Aaron, do you take the people from our work? Remember, uh, one of the uh, stances that the Pharaoh had was that he needed these people uh, to be slaves, and he needed it for a specific purpose of building these great cities, these great monuments uh, to him and to the, uh, to the uh, Egyptian gods. And if they were to lose this free labor, if you will, uh, then what will happen is that uh, this will uh, cause a lot of problems with, with the and ideas that Pharaoh had. Uh, also, by way of subjugating these people, he is able to hold control of them. Uh, he is showing his power over these people, these people who he thinks are his, his subjects. But in reality, we will see that they are God's children. They are God's people, and it is he who is sovereign over them. So, uh, therefore, the, uh, 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 the prophets ask that the people be let go. They're going to journey three days uh, time, and they are going to be able to offer their sacrifice to the Lord. They're going to uh, uh, be able to glorify their Lord, uh, lest they should die or uh, some uh, terrible thing should happen to them. Um, by being in the presence of God, uh, they will be able to have faith. They will be able to gain strength and so forth uh, from this meeting, from this worship that is to take place in the desert. So they said, the God of the Hebrews is the one who sent. Then the king of Egypt said to them, Why, Moses and Aaron, do you take people for my work? Go back to your work. Again, Pharaoh said, Look, the people of Israel are many now, so let us not give them rest from their work. All right? Um, this shows even more the severity of the cruelty of Moses, uh, that uh, one is to work, uh, and work without any kind of break, without any kind of compassion, uh, or, or any kind of concern for the people. It was a way of being contemptuous, showing contempt to the people of God. Uh, uh, by, uh, if they are weak, uh, if they are hungry, well, uh, they're going to be easier to control. You see, they're going to be able to be uh, his instruments to do whatever he says. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their clerks saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as yesterday and the day before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Therefore, you shall lay on them a daily quota of bricks they are to do each day. And you shall hold them to it. You shall not reduce it, for they are loafers. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labors of these men be oppressive and cause them anxiety. And let them not pay attention to empty words. Uh, Pharaoh is increasing his anger. He's increasing his cruelty to the people uh, by making them uh, be able to go and... and and not only do they have to, to make these bricks and, and fashion them and, and mold them and build the buildings, but now they have to supply their own material. You know, it's a further way of harassment. And uh, also, uh, it is uh, this straw mixed with this uh, clay or earth that is baked uh, is what actually holds the brick together. And, and it gives it its strength, you see. Uh, so, uh, therefore, um, he is going to call upon them to take that away, let them gather it for themselves, so that their, uh, their labor would be increased. Another thing that we see here is the quota. Give them a quota. Um, in many companies, uh, in many industries, uh, the people who are working have to produce so much work, okay? 
before the, the, the summer before I was ordained, married and ordained, uh, I worked at IBM. And um, being a part-time employer, the, uh, in fact, the, the people who worked there used to call us renegades. And what they did, they would give us jobs uh, uh, that were alongside the regular workers in order to increase the production. Okay? That year, there were 8,000 temps, 8,000 of us rent a kids that worked. And so therefore, it brought up the quota. Uh, by bringing up the quota, what is being implied here, let's overburden them so that they are not going to be able to keep up with the quota. You see, it's another way of harassing them. And of course, if you do not keep up with the, qu uh, the quota, then there are repercussions, which is the brutality of, of, of the uh, punishment that is being inflicted on them. So therefore, they cried out even more, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labors of these men be oppressive and cause them anxiety. There is a more, even more a tremendous suffering. Uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, and because of the refusal to let them go, now even a spiritual problematic. So the taskmasters of the people and their clerks went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go, get it yourselves wherever you can find it. Yet nothing will be reduced from your workload. The people were then dispersed throughout all of the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters also forced them to hurry, saying, Fill your daily quola of work as when straw was given to you. Also the clerks from the race of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters set over them, were beaten and questioned. Why have you not fulfilled your task in making bricks both yesterday and the day before and also today? You see this increasing severity, this, this pressure, this intense pressure, and this oppression that is being placed on the people of Israel by uh, the Egyptians by order of the Pharaoh. Then the clerks of Israel's sons entered and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? No straw is given your servants, and they say to us, Make bricks. And indeed, your servants are beaten. But the fault is with your own people. But he said, you are loafers. You are loafers. Therefore you shall say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now therefore go and work, for no straw shall be given to you. Yet you shall deliver the quota of bricks. In other words, um, uh, he sees this plea uh, of being able to be released uh, they are asking only for a three-day journey, which would imply a three-day journey back. Uh, it is not very much time, but even that short amount of time is being begrudged to them. And he thinks that the reason why they are going to go into the desert uh, to be able to be with their Lord uh, was because they were lazy. Uh, they did not want to be subjected to Pharaoh and his authority and they did not want to meet their quota of bricks uh, because they wanted to sacrifice to the Lord. So therefore, they are now being further uh, 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 punished and, and further uh, uh, pain is being inflicted on them, especially in the giving of the straw. Uh, it's also be able to understood that the straw of which the, uh, the Hebrews are now to gather is going to be of an inferior quality than what was provided by them before. So therefore, this would lead to a breakdown of, of their labor and uh, would give even more cause for them to be persecuted by Pharaoh and his taskmasters. Verse 20, as they departed from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, let the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of these servants to put a sword to his hand to kill us. The people of Israel are now being resentful of uh, this uh, command that Moses and Aaron has given to Pharaoh and they are blaming him or rather them for the suffering that they are uh, able to, in, that they're going to be able to uh, 
to, uh, to, to suffer in, in this land of misery, this land of tormentation and suffering. Um, for a very for a short time, uh, they enjoyed a life of plenty. Uh, they had a comfortable living. But now what is happening, the complete thing is, uh, change is happening and they find themselves uh, in uh, this suffering. And they are resentful of the suffering because they have not learned the lesson that has to be taught to them that, that glorifying God and suffering for his name go hand in hand. Okay? Uh, by making these comments, uh, they are resentful of the fact that they should have to suffer so. And as a result of what Moses and Aaron told them, which is the command of God, it's their fault, you see. It's God's fault that now Pharaoh is turning upon them. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Why is it you sent me? From the time I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has afflicted his people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. This, uh, th th this request of, of Moses, this questioning of Moses to God as to why he has done these, uh, these different things, uh, because the working of God is miraculous. The working of God is wondrous. Uh, it is beyond our comprehension. Uh, we cannot understand why the things uh, are happening the way they are happening. But we have to have the faith that all of these things are in God's hands. And uh, God's will ultimately will be done. And uh, as a result, uh, the people will come to a, a greater, uh, a greater uh, knowledge of God, a greater commitment to be able to serve him, to be able to increase their faith. Chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, How you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them from his land. As again I said, uh, the Lord is going to enter into this situation, and with his strong, powerful right hand, uh, he is going to be able to, uh, to, to uh, show Pharaoh uh, his power. Uh, his authority uh, and uh, the reason why he should be glorified and the fact that he is the only God. You remember that the people of Egypt worshipped a pantheon of gods. There were many different gods, different gods for different situations. And he is not one of many because he is only one. These pagan gods are false gods because there is only one true God. And uh, he will use his strong hand. So God also spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Uh, it's very important to be able to realize uh, he is stating not only who he is, but he is stating his authority, that he is in control. The lesson that Pharaoh has to learn, and his people along with him, is that he is Lord, that he is in control. And he is to be obeyed. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their God. But I did not reveal to them my name, the Lord. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaanites, the land of their sojourn, in which they were strangers. God is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God is true to his covenant that he had made with them. Uh, that he would give them a land for their own possession. And uh, this land of Cana would be one that would be flowing with milk and honey. Uh, it would be a gift uh, that would be given by God to his people. However, they are reminded that they are still sojourners, that this uh, land of Cana, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood it, was still a foreign land. They were still sojourners because their home was with the, the, the city that was not made by hands, the city that was founded by God, the city that would last forever. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, the Lord is reminding them of what he has done in the past. And he is faithful to the covenant that he had given them. And he will give them that covenant. And they will be able to sojourn. What had happened was, 
Once the people of Israel occupy this promised land, they make the foolish assumption that it is their property. Okay, uh, all the, uh, the the psalmist David said, uh, "The earth, the fullness of the earth, and all that dwells it in, is uh, where God dwells. Uh, it is His land, uh, and He allows His people to live there, in order to be able to." Uh, prepare themselves for the entrance into the the promised land, the promised land of the kingdom. I have also heard the groaning of my children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage, and I remembered my covenant. The covenant was that God would be with his people, that the covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be, uh, uh, would be upheld, uh, that he will uh, hear the voice of the oppression, and that he will come to the rescue. In fact, the fathers of the church have seen this as a, a type of figure of, of Christ who, who will be sent by the Father uh, to come into the world uh, and take on human flesh and be able to, uh, uh, to redeem his people Israel, to lead them out of this bondage to slavery, to sin uh, and to evil into this future land. Um, and uh, uh, make a new covenant with them, uh, a new agreement uh, for a, a better life, a better place in which they will dwell. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the Egyptian tyranny. I will rescue you from their bondage and redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. Okay? This outstretched arm of God is the means by which he will show his power, his authority, and he will release his people and set them free. And he will be able to, uh, they will be able to see the judgment and the power of God that he will show over Pharaoh and the Egyptians, that they are not the mighty, powerful people they were, uh, they thought they were. Uh, Pharaoh is not a god but he is only a human being that has to be subjected to Yahweh, to the Lord. Uh, and he is the one who will be in control. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. This is a sign of intimacy. This is a, a deeper relationship that God has uh, to uh, call his people to. Uh, with each covenant that he makes with his people, there is a deeper and deeper and more intimate relationship that he calls them to and enters into them so that finally that he would be their God and they would be his children. Uh, to put it in a New Testament terminology, that he will be our father and we will be his adopted children. Uh, we will be in the family of God. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they paid no heed to Moses because of their faint-heartedness and their cruel barge. They did not have faith in the power and the word of God and what he had to say that he would deliver them. But instead, they were focused on their own suffering. They were focused on their own problems, their, their own heartache. Uh, they were at one time willing to believe, but they did not want to have to suffer. Uh, they wanted to have a, a, an easier life. Uh, they could not understand why these things have, have happened to them. And they did not have the faith to be able to understand and realize that it is the Lord, their God, who has the power to set them free. So therefore, uh, what happened is they become faint-hearted. Uh, they lack the faith in order to trust in God's mercy. Now these are the heads of their father's houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, the son of Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. This is the family of Reuben. Now the sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jemim, Ohad, Jakim, Zohar, and Shual, the sons of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon, now these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their genealogy, Gershom, Kohath, and Merami. Levi lived 130 years. The sons of Gershom were Libni, 
Shimi, the houses of their family, the sons of Koholath, are Amram, Ishar, Hebron, Uziel, and Kohath, lived 130 years. The sons of Merai are Malai and Mushi. These are the families of Levi, according to their kindreds. Now Aram took as his wife Jochebed, the daughter of his father's brother, and she bore him Aaron and Moses and Miriam, their sister. And Amron lived 130 years. The sons of Ixar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zichtri. The sons of Uriel were Mishael, Eliphaz, Zithra. Now Aaron took his wife Elishba, daughter of the Amadam, the sister of Nashum, and she bore him Nadam, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithmaar. The sons of Korah were Asir, Ekkanan, and Abasa. These are the genealogy of Korah. Eliezer's son, Aaron's son, took his wife from the daughters of Putal, and she bore him Phineas. And these are the heads of the families of the Levites, according to their genealogy. Now these are the same Aaron and Moses, to whom God said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt with their army. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. Remember I told you in when we studied the uh, book of Genesis that the ability to, to be able to, tra uh, to, to uh, trace your ancestry was a very important thing to the Hebrew people. Uh, it uh, showed that they were truly one with the lineage that was the, that the, of the covenant that God made with his people. So therefore, there are many times, especially in the Pentateuch, where uh, all of these different names are able to be mentioned uh, to be all-inclusive. Uh, in other words, uh, God has come to, to save all of these families, all of these people. And by extension, when we see these different names, we're only given the names of, of um, uh, the men and their particular wives, uh, but uh, there are also children, there are also servants, there are also many other people who are a part of it. So therefore, we're talking about a, a, a great number of people. We're talking about a large nation, if you will. Now, we take this and contrast this to what the Lord said, that he would deliver his people. Uh, and also, it, it, it to be understood here, is that this is going to be a magnanimous effort. Because not only will God defeat Pharaoh and bring his people out of, uh, out of bondage, out of Egypt, but there, this will be a tremendous amount of people that are going to leave Egypt to be able to worship their God in the, in, in the desert. In the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to him, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am weak in speech, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? This is something that he said when he was originally called. Uh, so that we see now the weakness uh, on the part of, of Moses. Chapter 7. Now the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. What happens is that the prophet Moses stands in the place of God. And what happens is that Aaron becomes the priest. Uh, he is the spokesman of God. The fathers of the church have said that Moses is a type of Christ figure because just as Moses stood in the place of God uh, in the incarnation of the Son of God, uh, we will have God himself who will dwell with his people. Uh, who will set his people? Uh, who will set his people free? Uh, and um, that um, uh, he will be able to make over, make uh, make restitution. He will be able to to uh, be able to strengthen Moses in order to give him this task. No task that God gives is beyond our ability if He and His grace are a part of that picture. So therefore, He takes the place of God. And he is a very direct representative of God. 
just as the Lord is God and stands uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You shall speak all the command that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall speak to Pharaoh to send the children of Israel from his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. We have to be able to note here, as I said before, the Lord saying that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. Uh, again, it, it is not that Pharaoh is being uh, made to act in this way by God. Uh, it is not that Pharaoh was uh, uh, preordained to function in, in this capacity. It's just like some people who say that um, uh, uh, Judas uh, uh, was chosen because he would, uh, uh, would, he would uh, betray the Lord. Uh, this is not the proper way of thinking. Uh, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, as I said before, is when it is placed in the glory and the power of God uh, that each time Pharaoh sees these things, each time he sees his might, he, he hardens his heart. He is filled with rage and he rebels against God. We also note here that there are many signs and wonders that are going to happen in the land of Egypt. Uh, in the Gospel of St. John, the evangelist, whenever he, he refers to the wonders that Jesus performs, and in his Gospel he chooses set of, seven of them, he says that they are signs. These signs will show that it will point to something that is greater than themselves. It will be proof conclusive that it is God who is acting and the way of knowing this is the wonders that he will perform. Uh, these wonders of which God speaks, it's not just a, a miracle as, as some people understand it, but it is something that is overwhelming, something that has been never done before, something that shows without a single doubt that it is God who works and that he is powerful, that he is sovereign, he is quite able to bring his people out of Egypt, and that Pharaoh is but a pawn to him. But Pharaoh will not heed you, and I shall lay my hand on Egypt and bring my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt with my power and great vengeance. Okay? Uh, vengeance, not in an evil way, uh, not as a way of getting even, but as a way of justifying a way of being just, a way of, of, of uh, freeing his people from this oppression. Then all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Uh, this will be the ultimate sign of his authority and power, this stretching, of, uh, the stretching out of his hand, if you will, um, that they will be able to know that he is God and that he has this power and authority even over Pharaoh, uh, even over uh, the oppressors themselves, uh, so that um, the children of Israel will indeed be free and they will be able to know the glory of God. They will be able to see the glory of God in the actions that he takes. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show us a sign or a wonder, then you shall say to Aaron, your brother, take your rod and cast it on the ground before Pharaoh, and it shall become as a serpent. Remember, we said before, the fathers of the church have seen in this staff uh, a figure of the cross or a prefigurement of the cross. Uh, and this serpent, uh, this serpent uh, being symbolic of evil, uh, that Aaron will be able to, Moses and Aaron will be able to grasp that by the tail, and it will become a rod uh, again, uh, showing its superiority uh, over the power of Pharaoh. Uh, that uh, the, not only uh, was the uh, serpent, uh, uh, the rod, the rod changed into a serpent, but he was also able to be victorious over the magicians of Egypt who performed uh, what they called signs and wonders. Uh, and Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh and his servants, and they did so as the Lord commanded them. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. In response, Pharaoh called together the wise men, the sorcerers, 
the charmers of Egypt. And in like manner, they did the same with their sorceries. For each man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. But Pharaoh's heart was still hardened, and he did not give heed to them as the Lord had commanded. By uh, Moses' rod devouring these serpents and the rods of, of these magicians, these uh, false priests uh, of Egypt that were under the control of, uh, of Pharaoh, um, that shows the superiority of the power that God has given to Moses. In fact, it also shows uh, the superior of the power of the cross to be able to destroy evil, to be able to destroy sin itself that is symbolized in the eating of these serpents. And again, another sign is performed. Pharaoh's heart is again hardened, and he did not give heed to the Lord in his command. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Now go to Pharaoh early in the morning when he goes to the water, and shall stand by the water's bank to meet him, and you shall take in your hand the rod that turned into a serpent. Then you shall say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go to serve me in the desert. But indeed, until now, you will not, you will not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the water in the river with the rod in my hand, and I shall, it shall be turned to blood. Then the fish of the river shall die, the river shall stink, and the Egyptians will be unable to drink water from the river. This uh, staff touching uh, the uh, water and the water turning into blood is seen by many of the fathers of the church as a, a symbol of the suffering of the cross, the shedding of the blood of Christ that uh, will bring about this uh, punishment over sin and those who uh, are, are committing this sin. Uh, the fish in the river die. They are not able to properly eat. Uh, they are not able to drink the water. Uh, so therefore, uh, this has caused a tremendous suffrage to the uh, people of Egypt. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, your brother, Take your rod in your hand and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, their canals, their ponds, and all their standing water, so they may become blood. There shall the blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and of stone. So Moses and Aaron did so. As the Lord had commanded them, Aaron lifted up his hand with the rod and struck the waters in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. Then all the waters of the river were turned to blood. The fish in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink water from the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Then the sources of Egypt did the same with their sorceries, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not heed them, as the Lord said. Pharaoh then turned, uh, uh, Pharaoh then turned and went to his house. Neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug around the river for water to drink, because they could not drink the water from the river. Then seven days passed after the Lord struck the river. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to the Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go to serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your houses, into your bedroom, on your bed, into your houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, into your, uh, into your knitting bowls. Uh, the frogs will come up to you, your people, and all of your servants. Uh, the uh, frogs uh, and the bringing of the frogs was another one of the plagues, one of the uh, punishments that God gives to Pharaoh and the people of Israel. Uh, they are not able to uh, be able to eat. They are not able to enjoy any kind of, 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 of luxury. They are not able to be able to rest and, and so forth. They're, they're, they're going to be coming into the, the punishment or experiencing some of the punishment that they have inflicted upon God's people. Um, 
and the totality of, of, of all of the places that can ever be, it's important to be able to note that the plagues that uh, uh, have affected the Egyptian people did not affect the Hebrews, okay? It was something that was directed directly against Pharaoh. And again, as a result, uh, his heart is hardened. Uh, they would not learn that the Lord is the Lord, that he is the God of, of, of all, even Pharaoh. And uh, as a result, his heart was hardened. Even though the Lord performed these signs that should lead to faith, that should lead to the ability for Pharaoh to see and comprehend and understand, led to his damnation, led to the hardening of his heart. Chapter 8. Again the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron your brother, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the rivers, the canals, the pools, and cause frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Then the sorcerers did the same with their sorceries and brought up frogs of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh then called for Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord for me, and let him take away the frogs for me and my people, and I will let the people go. Excuse me. I can't turn the page. I will let the people of Israel go. Uh, the Pharaoh uh, says that he uh, shows a sign of weakness, that he is willing to let his people go in order to sacrifice to the Lord, uh, that uh, he is able to make this promise. But we will see what will happen just a few verses from now. Moses then replied to Pharaoh, Appoint me a time when I shall pray for you, for your servants and for your people to make the frogs disappear from you your people, and your houses. Only in the river will they remain. So Pharaoh said, Tomorrow. Moses then said, Let it be according to your word that you may know this is none other than the Lord. This is the Lord who is acting. Uh, this is the power of God that is being made. It is the finger of God, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit of God that is making these things happen in order to, to set his people free from bondage, in order to come to him in the, in the wilderness to be able to, to sacrifice. Uh, at first, Pharaoh begins to soften. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land, that it become lice on men, on four-footed animals, and throughout all the land of Egypt. Thus Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and four-footed animals. And there was lice in all the dust of the land. Now the sorcerers so worked with their sorceries to bring forth lice, but they could not. And there were lice on men, the four-footed animals. Then the sorcerers said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not heed them as the Lord has said. This is the finger of God. Ironically, these pagan sorcerers, these false priests were, be, were able to see God's wonder, uh, God's power being performed. Although they did not completely understand what was happening, at least they knew that this was indeed the finger of God. And by saying finger of God and not whole hand or whole arm, it shows the, the power of God that he is able to do with his finger these tremendous things in order to be a sign, be a wonder, not only to the Egyptians, but also to the people of Israel, that God is fighting for them to be able to show them God's authority, that God will be true to his word, that he will deliver them. So therefore, they should be increasing their faith, if you will, and the ability of their Lord to be able to perform these things that he has commanded. Uh, the ref Pharaoh refused, uh, and um, it, they uh, were not able to be persuaded. Again, the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand there before Pharaoh as he goes to the water. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go to serve me in the desert, or else if you will not let my people go, Behold, I will send the dog fly on you and your servants, 
and on your people into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with the dog fly and also the ground on which they stand. Now on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no dog fly be there, that you may know that I am the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. You see, he is going to show conclusively by inflicting this, uh, this plague upon the Egyptians and showing that it is not affecting God's own people, uh, the Hebrews in this land of Goshen, thus showing God's favoritism to his people and his punishment on the arrogance of Pharaoh and his people. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this shall be a sign in the land. So the Lord did thus, and the dog fly came in abundance into the houses of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. And the land was destroyed by the dog fly. These particular plagues, uh, there are modern uh, uh, theologians, scriptural theologians, that are saying that they are unique to this part of the world. There's nothing strange about dog flies. There's nothing strange about lice uh, and, and, and the abundance of frogs and so forth. But we have to be able to realize that the wonder that is being performed is, first of all, that God issues the command. God performs the wonder at the particular time at a particular place in order to show his mastery. This is not some kind of freak of nature, but it is indeed the very hand of God himself. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, he is uh, told to allow his people to go and uh, uh, be able to sacrifice to, to, to God in the wilderness. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. But Moses said, Is it not right to do so? For we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. If we should sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, they would stone us. We will go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, as he said to us. Pharaoh then said, I will set you away, and you shall sacrifice to the Lord your God in the desert. Only you shall not go very far away, and then pray for me to the Lord. Then Moses said, Indeed, I will go out from you and pray to God, and tomorrow the dog fly will depart from you and from your servants and your people. But let Pharaoh not deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go sacrifice to the Lord. It is not proper that they should worship God in a foreign land. It is not proper that his people be able to offer sacrifice in a land that is polluted with these pagan gods and these pagan idols. But rather, they are to go into the desert to be able to be separated. In fact, to be called by God, to be blessed by God, to be chosen by God, literally means to be set apart from God, okay, for exclusively the service to God. You cannot dwell in the world, you cannot be in Egypt and serve God at the same time. There has to be a choice that has to be made. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, it is the Lord who calls upon the people of Israel to make this choice, to be able to come to him in the desert. And we see that Pharaoh is, 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 is willing to do these, this thing. And as a result, through the prayer of Moses, uh, this plague is lifted. And again, uh, we see the power of God in that not only he sent this plague, but he also lifted it. And as a result, uh, the uh, people of Egypt were also uh, able to, to, uh, uh, to depart from this, this, this punishment that is given by God. So uh, he is warned. Pharaoh is warned. You know, you said this all the time. You, you get frightened, uh, you agree uh, to listen to God, but then when things are set in motion, uh, you renege and uh, you become hardened again. You become uh, contrary to what your words have said. And as a result, uh, you're being warned now that it is the Lord God that you're dealing with and uh, you are warned not to go back on your word because even something more will happen to you as a result. 
So Moses went out from Pharaoh, and he prayed to God. Thus the Lord did as Moses said, and removed the dog fly from Pharaoh, his servants, his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let his people go. We see the obstinance. We see the, the, the sinfulness. We see the complete arrogance of, of Pharaoh. We, I would like to also point out something that, uh, that uh, I have enjoyed, uh, something that I have read in preparation for these classes. We have to be able to note, first of all, that Moses is able to speak to God. He is able to speak to God as a friend. In fact, we have this even in the hymnography of the church. And uh, God listens to him. Uh, when, uh, Fa when Moses is speaking to God, it is a type of prayer. Uh, it, it is a dialogue. Just as Adam was able to speak to God in the coolness of the night in the Garden of Eden, uh, so now Moses is able to speak to God. And we have to note that when Moses offers the prayer, that God listens, that God allows it to be answered. So therefore we see uh, the truth of what the Apostle James says. The prayer of a just man is powerful in its effect. Okay, And we will see further as we study this book how uh, this intimacy between uh, God and Pharaoh begins to grow. And they are able to communicate. They are able to be uh, on the kind of the same path uh, in uh, their ministries to the people of Israel. Uh, we're going to stop at this time, and we will come back next week uh, to continue in our study of the book of Exodus. And when we come back, we will take over where we left off, and we will begin at chapter 9, verse 1. I thank all of you for being here. I thank you for bearing with me and giving me this opportunity to share these things with you, to study the Word of God. Um, I was very happy to receive some emails this past week from people who were uh, in uh, New Zealand. I received one from Germany. I received also another one from uh, Thailand. Uh, I thank you very much for your questions, for your comments. Uh, if you have any questions or anything you want to share, please email me. I love hearing from you. I'll do my best to answer your questions and maybe some of your observers and some of your comments will be able to aid, aid in the study of God's word in these classes. Uh, God willing, we will meet together next week. We ask you to be with us and we now close, as is our tradition, with the hymn offered to the mother of God. In the name of the Father and the Son of, and the Holy Spirit, you are truly deserving of glory, O birth giver of God, the ever blessed and most pure mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim, who as a virgin gave birth to God the word, true birth giver of God, we magnify you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, glory to Jesus Christ.